أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Welcome back to uh, this series of uh, Witnesses for Humanity. Uh, today we will have Dr. Astam talking about two great figures in the history of humanity, Mahatma Gandhi and Che Guevara. For me, to look back at what we have covered, the stories all have a similar ethos and essence. The stories of Akiva, Socrates, Kuwan, or Nabi Isa are all enduring legacies that continue to inspire us and guide. We hope that we've been able to demonstrate the true heroism that they have shown in the lesson that we have learned that heroism lies not in the absence of fear but in the resolve to act righteously despite it. When you look at Thomas Moore, Al-Hallaj or Sarmad Kashani or Said Nursi, they all stand out as paragons of this unyielding spirit, their lives marked by profound sacrifice echo the timeless call for inner justice transcending the specific religions and cultural contexts to offer universal lessons in courage and in conviction. So these are the exemplary lives that we have been covering over the last seven episodes. And I now would like to hand over to Dr. Asram to enlighten us on two more such figures who have made a true difference to humanity. Dr. Aslam, over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Osbillahi min shaitan rajeem. Bismillah rahman rahim. Thank you very much for this introduction. And certainly without other formalities, I'll come directly to the point that uh, the two great individuals of the last century, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi and Chigoera, are not only the heroes of uh, their own nations, but they are the source of inspiration for millions of people. Even though they have contrasting ideologies, even though they had contrasting methodologies, even though they had con contrasting uh, work ethics, yet their concern was humanity and their concern was the plight of those people who were suffering in the end of the colonialism of what they, some of them called or one of them called new colonialism, uh, the capitalism, new capitalism, and imperialism and whatnot. I think uh, I have personal fascination with these two individuals because uh, Gandhi was my ideal when I was growing up in India. And Chukwera was also my ideal when I was uh, at the university level and learning about what was happening because uh, even though I was very young, yet I felt the kind of uh, uh, empathy with what he had done, even though he was killed in 1967, Chigoera, uh, and I was at that particular time not very old, yet I still had, uh, I remembered his name, I still had some of his writings and the day when he was killed in, I think, Bolivia, at the instance of the powers and that uh, still run the world, there was a moment of sadness, and not only uh, in my own, but in the hearts of many others who were influenced. He far away from Argentina, where he was born, and... Uh, and and in south from South America, where his major focus was, even though towards the end of his life, he was more concerned about uh, bringing out a worldwide revolution involving Asian and African nations. So let's uh, start with <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, it is amazing to see that a person of that stature emerged in the 19th century at a time 
when India was under the occupation of the colonial rulers. And India was primarily a society that was turned into a racist society by the British who had denied Indians every right to live as a human being whose, whose uh, rights were exploited and his resources were being, being used, misused for the benefit of a aristocracy in England. He was born in Gujarat, which is now one of the states in India. And he was a lawyer, politician, social activist, and a writer. And he led the national movement against the British rule of India. And he is now considered the father of his nation, he, uh, of, of the country. And internationally, he is recognized as a person who basically introduced the doctrine of nonviolent protest against the colonizers, against the oppressors, which we call the Satyagra or the movement of truth, the struggle for the truth. Gandhi is known as Mahatma, means great soul. And it is the adoration of huge crowds, you know, when he visited England. Uh, and uh, the way he was treated there and the people who came out on the streets uh, trying to see the what they call the naked fakir of the time. And uh, yet with his movement, he defeated the mightiest power of that time through this non-violent method because he knew that even though the option to lead uh, the movement on violent path was available, yet he was uh, uh, determined to basically practice non-violence as a <clears throat> not only a tool but as an ideology to focus on that. And nonviolence does not mean that you would not stand up and take arms against the enemy. What it means that you would suffer to and endure the hardships to make sure that you achieve the goal that you want to achieve by knocking the consciousness of those individuals. And certainly in the context of India, where a large majority of the people peasants and were workers and were deprived of their social rights and deprived of their dignity for so many years. That perhaps was the right methodology. Uh, uh, and, and certainly some people can say that, you know, when you compare his movement and try to draw a certain kind of conclusion in relation to Imam Hussain, then how come Imam Hussain, you know, fought against you see that that particular moment because the situations were different and Imam had reached to that point that a power that was so brutal that it would even demolish the Kaaba, even demolish the holiest shrine of Islam, a, that who would not hesitate in grabbing the power against the will of the Quranic teachings against the, uh, the, 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 the divine will certainly cannot be stopped. Only by, you know, passive resistance, one has to have a very aggressive attitude in order to create an example that the powers that be must be fought and must be challenged. And it is in that particular context we see, we see uh, a similarity and an and understanding of the uh, of the goals that these two individuals have. Now, <clears throat> Gandhi. Uh, you know, was born in Gujarat and he had his, his education in England and then he moved to South Africa because he was not allowed to practice in India <clears throat> the way he uh, would have loved to. And in South Africa, the, the, the Muslim community in Java stood up for him and he 
I was supported by that community. And he fought for the rights of the Indians and for the rights of those people who were fighting against apartheid, even though apartheid was not a very uh, well-known idiom at that particular time, yet the practice was there. And then later on, then he moved to 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 India to basically organize the the, the 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 movement. He mixed up, of course, his own religious traditions with the movement that he was having. And then, you know, yet he was the one who made sure that the religious pluralism of India is never compromised. And I think that is one of the beauty of the movement that the movement had included people from different religions and from different ethnicities and other things. Now, the his place in history, not only the history of India, but I think the history of the movements of the world for freedom and justice is well recognized. The British had very a strange kind of mixed feelings towards him. They were amused. They were bewildered. They had some sort of suspicion. And they also have resentment. And except for a very tiny minority of Christian missionaries and radical socialists, the British tended to see him at best as a, as a utopian visionary and at worst, a cunning hypocrite. <laughs> that, that's how the British elites and the British rulers had defined him. And uh, he was the one who basically challenged them. And then they, they were bewildered that how come this person who, uh, you know, is living a very simple life, who believes in the ideals of his own faith in certain matters, but uh, develops that uh, ideology of a pluralistic nation can defeat him. And, uh, and the Gandhi was well aware of all this kind of prejudice. And the movement or the Satyagra, the truth, or a struggle for truth, certainly was the outcome of that kind of understanding and he knew that he would ultimately prevail because he believed that truth is God, God is truth, and ultimately it's the truth that prevails. And now his life had seen three major campaigns in 1920 and 21, 930 and 34, and 1940 and 42. And it was designed to engender that process of self-doubt and questioning that was uh, to undermine the moral defense of his adversaries and to contribute uh, together with the objective uh, realities of the post-war world, world war to producing the grant of uh, dominion status in 1947 and the British abdication uh, in India was the first step in the liquidation of the British Empire on the continent of Asia and Africa. And Gandhi's image as a rebel enemy, you know, of, of that kind of new imperialism and imperialism as was being practiced and uh, uh, is, is, is well documented and well understood. Now, his vision was to create a pluralistic India. An India that reflects the religious diversity. An India that basically lives its own traditions uh, without interfering in the personal and the religious affairs of others and with the, uh, with the dignity of all uh, without following strictly the hierarchies of his own faith and the hierarchies created by other faiths also. And he was, uh, uh, it, it is that kind of ideology, the pluralistic India, that was, of course, questioned by an organization that very, and what you call paradoxically, now runs the country. 
and and, and basically sometimes plays the card of Gandhi to its advantage, even though most of its members are supporters of those individuals who plotted against Gandhi. And one of them, God say, who had killed Gandhi on uh, January 30th, 1948, a few, you know, months after the independence of India, they adore him, they adore God say. Yet, on the other hand, they also, in the international forums, talk about Gandhi and his movement for nonviolence. What is interesting is that in the last uh, several years, especially in the last decade, the violence against religious minorities and the violence against those people for whose rights Gandhi had fought have increased in India. And, and certainly there is a big battle that has been going on in that country in terms of living up to the ideals of Gandhi or compromising or using him as a showcase of nonviolence to the world. But his impact is beyond this political controversy because millions and millions of Indians adore him and see him as the father of the nation, the true sense of the term, that he cared for the people. He cared for their dignity. He cared for their rights. He cared for what we call the, the rightful place and rightful rights in that country. And in that respect, <clears throat> he would always be part of India's life, no matter how many people in the political arena use his murder on 30th of January as a justification for liberating India from the pluralism and then turning that into and the monopoly of one particular religion. So it is in that context we see Gandhi. Now, when we come to Che Guevara, we find a very contrasting example where after looking at the conditions of farmers and ordinary people in Guatemala and South America, this young man who had was trained was being trained as a medical doctor, as a surgeon, was also a poet, was also a writer, reached to the conclusion that without changing the political structures in these countries, without questioning the the power elites and without removing them, the rights of people will not be restored. That was a time when one of the Great companies called the United Fruit uh, Company used to own billions, millions of acres of land in South America where people were treated as slaves and where people were uh, forced to live as subhuman life. And Chiguera, of course, growing up in Bolivia, or even though he was born in Argentina and in 1928, 20 years before the murder of Gandhi. Uh, at, at the time when Gandhi was murdered, he was approximately 20 years of age. Yet he basically had reached to the conclusion that without armed struggle, it is almost impossible to challenge the powers that be because they would not tolerate the equality and the, of the peasants and the farmers. And that's what basically he stood up for. And he went from countries to countries, he mobilizing people, organizing, and basically leading the people's movement in terms of the liberation of the Cuba and in terms of many other places. And his idea was that the nations of Africa and Asia should come together to overthrow the regimes that a post-colonial world had imposed upon them in the form of imperialism, where the resources were being used by a multinational or corporate world to exploit the people in different names and to enslave them without using the word slavery and to basically deny them their basic human rights. And certainly when one looks at the conditions of people in Brazil and in so in many South American countries in Africa today, one finds an echo of what he was saying. And one finds that even though the movements have 
person, yet the conditions have not changed tremendously or in a great deal. So it is in that particular context, we see that uh, Chiguera knew the dangers of what he was doing. And finally, he was hunted down in Bolivia where he was killed, I think. And then, and see the dream, Chiguera did not end with this murder. And of course, the points are, fingers are pointed out to various intelligence agencies of the world that were controlled by the white supremacist groups that were controlled by uh, the agents of the multinational corporations. And, and certainly that struggle goes on even today. It is in that particular context we see Chiguera, even though he was a Marxist, he believed in the communist ideology, <clears throat> yet his passion for human dignity, his passion for human rights, his passion for righteousness, his passion for a world where people would be treated equally without any discrimination, where the rights of people will be restored to them is beyond one's own capacity, capacity of imagination. And it is in that particular context we see both Gandhi and Chiguera as the, the two contrasting people with the same goal and same understanding and same vision for their people. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Walji might add a few more things about. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Aslam. I think uh, that was a very good analysis uh, in terms of both uh, these personalities. Uh, and then we learn, you know, uh, from you and from the other readings that Che Guerra, uh, with his sort of unyielding spirit, uh, was really, I mean, he was burning with the fire of revolution. Uh, for him, I guess the jungles of Latin America were really his, his battleground. And and he was, you know, it was not just, you know, about weapons, but an unbreakable resolve. He fought against the change, the change of tyranny for the poor and the oppressed. And uh, when we look at Mahatma Gandhi, uh, he fought too in his own way. Uh, always, you know, the gentle architect, uh, as he has been called of India's freedom. Uh, he embraced the power of peaceful protest. And, uh, you know, many a times Gandhi referred to Imam Hussain as his inspiration in terms of saying, you know, this is a, a matter of protest. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, his relationship with the British colonial rule. And, and I can't help imagine the scenario that I have, you know, read and, and imagine the scenario that, you know, clad in his, in his simple cloth, that he kind of marches across the salt uh, flats with his, uh, you know, with his people. And he was equally comfortable wearing the exact same attire at Buckingham Palace. Uh, you know, his, his humility and his self-confidence was simply unbelievable. And I remember reading that when he was asked, because it was winter, he was sitting, standing next to the king at Buckingham Palace. And somebody asked Gandhi to say, Mr. Gandhi, this is winter. Are you not feeling cold? And his witty reply as always was that the king is wearing enough for the two of us. That was his wit. He was comfortable. He was comfortable in his own spirit. He was comfortable in his in his own self. And and again, his wit was something extraordinary. Uh, he was once asked to say, a reporter asked him, said, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, I think it's a good idea. That was Gandhi. Uh, you know, and yet, you know, he stood and he shook, you know, the the very pillars of British colonialism and started this wave of independence movements across the world. Sadly, as you mentioned, that some people in India are trying to rewrite history. The pluralism that Gandhi offered is not sitting well with the authorities that be in India today. And amongst other things, some people are trying to rewrite history. But you know, when heroes come, these witnesses come, they have witnessed and they have witnesses 
to what they have witnessed. And therefore, things like this can never be erased. In Karbala too, we see not one, but 72 men who stood against these insurmountable odds on the scorching plains of Karbala. And their legacy, many have tried to erase it, their legacy lives on. And this is why we call them witnesses to humanity. So as we reflect on all these towering figures, Shara, we will see you again tomorrow. Uh, but we are reminded that their battles were not merely of their time or during their time, but these were calls to our conscience for today. With that, we say, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.